All right, good morning, everyone. Welcome to the first meeting of our new President's Council on Sports, Fitness, and Nutrition. Uh, my name's Jim Worthington. Um, clearly, this is the highlight of my career, getting on the President's Council. Um, I've been in the fitness industry 40 years. I'd like to say that I've been on the front line uh, working with people on Main Street. Um, I, I got involved in the industry when it really even wasn't an industry. If you think back 40 years ago, people were working out in garages and so on and so forth. So that tells you how old I am. Um, my uh, particular interest in the 40 years has been to change people's lives, to make pe people's lives better. And uh, m the vehicle in which I've done that is my club, which is the Newtown Athletic Club, which happens to be one of the largest uh, health, health club lifestyle centers in the country. Uh, accommodating 12,000 members. And that's been a kind of a, uh, an experimental uh, process for me, growing it over the years from a small business to 15,000 square feet to a 250,000 square foot health wellness uh, facility on 25 acres. So uh, we've impacted a lot of lives. And um, more recently, I've been honored with becoming the chairman of the largest trade Global Trade Association in the world, URSA, whose mission is to grow, promote, and protect the global fitness industry and get more people active. And as you all well know, we have a global obesity crisis as well as a United States obesity crisis. So our goal is to try to uh, change that and, and get people more active, particularly youth. And it starts with youth. And the reality is that um, exercise is medicine. And as soon as we figure out that getting people active is really the, the, the way to solve our, our health care crisis, uh, that would be best for our country and something will make America much better. So thank you. It's been a great, great experience so far, and I appreciate being part of this. <laughs> Recruitment is the key because everything else is after the fact. Um, if you, again, expand on the mentoring, uh, you've got a lot of kids that are either in there still playing at the early college age or kids that have maybe played in high school that still have a love for the game that aren't. They would be a place that I would clearly look to get, get people involved. Uh, certainly volunteer parents, though that's where a lot of training has to come in after the fact for sure, particularly if they're coaching their own kids. You want to make sure they understand the mission of wh why they're there. And the last thing I think is an untapped resource is seniors. I mean, you're talking about a lot of people that, you know, have the free time, the ability to get involved. And if you could recruit people that have that, still that love for the sport, love for the game, and get them involved, they would, it would be a win-win for both parties, kids and seniors. So I think that the recruitment aspect is really important. Getting more kids to play sports clearly can impact their health in positive ways. However, along with recruiting and training, qualified coaches, mentors, volunteers in general, who can teach the fundamentals of a particular sport, there are some serious safety concerns that we need to consider. 3.5 million kids a year under the age of 14 are treated for sports injuries annually. So clearly it's a problem. Um, and uh, part of that problem, the reason these things occur, is a lot of kids under the age of 12 specialize in specifically one sport that puts a lot of strain on them physically. So that's a, something we have to educate people to realize that, and I'm sure Herschel can attest to this, I and mean, he probably did a whole lot of things when he was a kid, and so, so did Mariano. You, 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 wanna, you just don't want, if you're throwing a baseball every day and not trying other things, they found that that's something that, that doesn't help them over time. Um, something that indirectly affects the safety is cost, uh, cost of participating. Because when you have to pay for fees, then the equipment becomes uh, something that isn't as easily uh, be able to be purchased. So, you know, when, when fees are in, out of line, and Rob and I talked about that yesterday, we, he had a, a friend that has a couple kids that are in travel leagues that it's $400 a pop. And, you know, then you turn around and you got to buy cleats and things like that. There's only so much money to go around. Things like uh, safe playing fields, proper equipment, uh, correctly fitted equipment is important proper hydration, nutrition. There's so many things that go into safety. Qualified coaches who understand training and coaching techniques, which is because if you get a coach that's, you know, trying to work you out or something or teaching you the wrong things, Robert can attest to that. That's like the worst thing in the world. Um, things that are such as the rules of the game. The rules are designed to keep you safe. 
So if you're uh, back in the day, I, they used to teach me to lead with my helmet when I would tackle. Well, that's taboo these days. You don't do that anymore. Uh, you got to know the rules of the game, and, and they're there to protect the, the, the individuals. Look at the NFL, what they're doing now. Um, respect for the game. That starts with the parents and the coaches. I mean, you talk about safety. I mean, how many times have we heard there's brujas at the end of a game over a kid's nine-year-old Little League game? I mean, that's not the thing you want to teach a kid, and certainly that's not a safe environment. Um, inclusivity and value of each athlete, regardless of skill level. I think a couple of the kids talked about that earlier. That's where bullying gets involved. So, I mean, uh, inclusivity starts with the parents, goes right down to the kids. If they learn that Johnny, who's maybe not the best player in the team, is just as important as someone else, that s stops the bullying and that creates a safe environment. So I know I went down the laundry list, but it was important, I think, that, that topic. One area we have not touched upon in terms of the safety of youth athletes is the protection against abuse, not just emotional abuse, but physical and sexual abuse. Any comments or thoughts about that and how to perhaps address that in our strategy? I think it's critical to target the, uh, since the age group we're talking about, who do they look up to? Who are their role models? I mean, who, who would get that message across? And I think if we're going to do a media campaign of any sort, we have to find those people that they identify with because they're not going to listen to their parents or someone who's, you know, maybe older. but. And I don't know who those are. My kids are 26 and 7 years old, so I have no idea what this age group is looking for. But whoever they are, they're the ones we should target to see. Because as you said, Linda, you know, this is an important thing for everybody. So I'm sure we can find people out there that could be spokespeople at a lower level at that age group that we're talking I, about. I think you're right. So does anyone want to share the experience as a coach? perhaps not coaching your own child, but other children, and maybe what you learned. What I learned really was the biggest uh, challenge was working with other adult parents that were coaches of the other teams. Um, you know, we would have a recreational league that would, say in baseball, that would lead to a travel team. Well, the recreational league became more competitive than the travel team. and. Uh, you know, the, the idea behind that was to give everybody an opportunity to play and to try to convince, and, and, and get this, my, my kids were in a league that had, only had four teams that were age 10 through 12. So, I mean, it wasn't like this big league. And you would have thought that winning the, that little four league team, team league was a, like the World Series. And the people took it way too serious. And you would just try to emphasize, I'm as competitive as anybody, but that wasn't the place, that wasn't the, right format to be competitive. So the biggest issue was really the, the other parents, quite frankly. And uh, very few people, I think, share the same mindset of that this was all about it, all inclusivity and fun and getting all the kids to have a great time. And I look at the statistic I cited earlier when at the age of 13 you lose, uh, or that, uh, that I, maybe I didn't cite it earlier, I was going to, you lose 70% of the kids after the age of 13. Well, there's a reason for that. And I think it's just not fun. And the parents are the reason why it's not fun, because kids are predisposed to have fun. They like to have fun. It's the parents that make it not fun. And that's my thoughts. Any burning last thoughts? Broadly opening up the floor. Right. Topics related, though, please. You know, we haven't really touched on how we're going to get more involvement from kids. and. Uh, you know, there's some tried and true things that people have done. Certainly schools are, are one vehicle, which if you get kids involved early in sports and bring back physical education and some of the things that have been cut from the budget in, in a lot of school districts. But uh, schools would be one thing, uh, community events. But one that's uh, near and dear to my heart, which is the public-private uh, uh, relationship. Um, in just in my industry, there's 38,000 health clubs. If you were able to convince those clubs to open up their doors to uh, youth of a certain age group for free, actually, I do that. Uh, we also, at my particular club, uh, provide a financial uh, assistance plan so that no one's left uh, behind, so that if they cannot afford it, they are scholarshiped. Uh, if we can work with the uh, private sector to find ways. I know the YMCA, and I, you know, the, 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 they, they give all seventh grade students a free membership to a certain number in each one of their facilities. Why the private sector isn't able to do that, I don't know, but that's something that we should 
kind of pursue. I do have a in, little bit of an in there. Uh, that would be a great opportunity to, to, to get more people involved, a, as well as provide programming for kids that are younger. Some facilities do, some don't. But each one of them have fitness facilities that you could turn around, say a certain age group could learn how to train properly, how to get exercise, and that could create a lifelong habit if you turned around and gave a kid a year membership. So, I mean, there's ways, to, and that's just one example, but the private uh, public partnership is really, I think, key to lean on you know, corporate America to say, look, this is, a, this, this is something will pay off for you in the long run because healthcare costs are strangling companies. And if we can reduce those health care costs from them, this is the way to do it. And one other, I'm big on statistics, but for $1 upfront and preventative, so in an exercise program or a nutrition program, there's a $4 savings on the back end. Any businessman would do that deal every day of the week. I'll, let me give a dollar to get four back. I'll do that. Give me as many dollars as I can do it. So it's a great investment for these companies to do that because that, that's their f future workforce. So. Great point. So thank you, council members, for all of your contributions during the roundtable.